we have um, the topic of implementation of NUMS in industry. Um, so we will be talking about industrial R&D and I'm, I'm very happy to have um, four great panel members um, that will be doing most of the talking hopefully today. And um, I would like to welcome to the virtual stage, Mario Beilmann from Böhring Engelheim, Phil Hewitt from Merck, Stefan Gustermann from Roche, and Jochen Kühnel from Bayersdorf. And as always, we will start our um, panel discussion, our webinar, with a poll today, where we will um, would like to see where you all um, coming from, what's the background, so that also our panel members know a little bit better the audience um, that is here today. And then we will do a short round of introduction where you can get to learn more about our panel members. So the poll should be up there already. So we have about half, half so far um, from basic science and one quarter from industry. And then um, very interestingly, um, a spread between translation science hospitals and organizations and regulatory. Okay, so now we learned a little bit about the audience today. And I would give now the word to the panel members so that they can all introduce each other. Um, and um, I want to, I would like to ask you already to start now, if you have questions to put it in the Q and A um, section, and we will then address your questions um, after the introduction round. So I would think we start with Jochen Kühnel. Right. Jochen, you can Good rudely afternoon. introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Peter, for a kind introduction. Um, so yeah, <clears throat> to be here. Good afternoon. My name is Jochen Kühnel. I'm working here at Biostoff in Hamburg. So my background is cell molecular biology. Um, I started 2008 in Biostoff working on a topic skin and uh, headed a lab for quite a while working on in vitro systems like skin sensitization assessment, genotoxicity, systemic toxicity. And there I focused a little bit on MPS and also engaged in some external activities on three hours. And recently I entered the realm of risk assessment. So that's what I'm doing. So um, we as a cosmetic industry, we have on one sole option to uh, actually um, assess new uh, sa compound safety, and this is num base. So we prioritize the compounds in early project phases. We do the safety evaluation of specific endpoints, uh, for instance, with OECD as, uh, validated num methods for endpoints like skin sensitization or gene toxicity as said. We also try to include new num options on um, weight of evidence analysis um, because there are a lot of options out there which are not validated yet but have, have a lot of promise. And we do so also, for instance, in case studies, which we try to also use to promote the regulatory acceptance for different NUMs. Uh, this is done internally as well as externally with Cosmetics Europe. And also we try to um, establish new methods at Biostorf uh, for different endpoints. We also try to coordinate different CRO offered methods for our uh, purpose. And we have several projects to evaluate the applicability of MPS systems for our purpose. Um, here we, for instance, cooperate with, with startups, but also with now grown uh, different CROs like the tissues where we try to, to implement their systems in our risk assessment workflows. All right. Thank you, Jochen. And we'll now switch to Stefan. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and welcome everybody for today. So yeah, very quick. Um, uh, introduction of myself. Um, I met Hoffman Laroche. Um, yeah, before that, um, I had a close link to Tübingen, where I made my PhD actually in ophthalmology. And then moving on to Roche as a postdoc, um, working since ever in in vitro models and so on. And then, um, meanwhile, I'm a group leader and a principal scientist um, in at Hoffman Laroche and um, working under um, pharmaceutical sciences, a, com a department which is focusing on preclinical safety assessment. And we do run a lot of in vitro models for safety assessment. So what is my link to NUMS and in vitro models specifically, also since I joined Roche, I mean, first 
um, I would say we apply them from very early to late, which is some um, early TA target assessment to clinical lead selection, entry of entry into human enabling studies, and also later in clinical trials where we try to understand mechanisms of toxicity and also to support um, further ongoing clinical, clinical development. Um, in my case, um, I focus very much with my team and, and the group about uh, the area space of CNS um, in the context of um, brain models, um, then ocular toxicity, um, where we looked a lot into um, um, yeah, ocular toxicity of drugs, not only of the retina, but also in choroid and um, recently also in the front of the eye and teratogenicity which is also one important topic um, to look into alternative methods um, to amprophytal development testing and early screening of compounds. And um, there we also could recently um, work on implementing a human relevant in vitro model for um, teratogenicity assessment. Hey, then. thank you, Stefan, and welcome to Mario. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter, and good afternoon also from my side. Uh, my name is Mario Ballmann. I'm a biologist by training. And my PhD on molecular and cell biology at the universities of Mainz and Cologne. And already a while ago, 1999, I uh, started my industry work with Spuringer Ingelheim. I moved to the south of Germany uh, to our research and development site, uh, which is located in Biberach and there is, uh, which is in Baden-Württemberg. Uh, since then, I worked in different departments with Spuringer Ingelheim. I started in the research division and the cardiometabolic department. I did there Genomics is the first available gene chips there. Then I moved to the cardiovascular research and uh, did cell model development, mainly on angiogenesis, proangiogenesis. Then I changed over to development division and joined the non-clinical drug safety department, um, so which we call toxicology department. Also there, I uh, started uh, doing uh, toxicogenomics with the gene chips, uh, but um, I quickly moved uh, more to uh, the cell and organ model development, introduced in vitro uh, tox assays uh, in this department there. Uh, I'm heading the cellular toxicology lab there, and together with my team over the years, we, um, yeah, we build a huge toolbox with cell-based methods for investigative toxicology. We implemented an in vitro toxicology screening platform uh, here from the development side, but uh, into the research phase, we implemented there these assays. Um, and we are part of the, um, the generation of the de-risking strategy for our drug candidate programs. Um, I would like to mention that I'm responsible for external engagement and especially for the collaborations with the 3R community or the alternative methods community. So we are a member of Cut Europe and also of the EPAA. So, and this is beyond the pharma industry, so it's connected to the other industry sectors. NUMS can, yeah, are of course not only in vitro methods and also the, um, yeah, can be defined more narrowly or more broader. Uh, I would uh, see on this slide uh, NUMS as all the in vitro methods uh, we use uh, here in in our toxicology department and give you a very quick introduction where we use uh, the, the assays, starting with the early research. Uh, there we use uh, screening assays, very simple assays. However, we also introduced already uh, or implemented already a while ago uh, spheroid, uh, assay, uh, spheroids, uh, organoids in uh, a 14-day repeated dose assay on a regular routine um, um, basis. Uh, the, for regulatory purpose, uh, we can only use um, yeah, validated uh, in vitro assays uh, for which um, guidelines exist. This is uh, mainly true. There are not so many assays available yet. Uh, however, for the genetic toxicology, for example, uh, we use these in vitro assays. Uh, also for skin tolerability, there are validated assays and guidelines available, and we use this on a regular basis for our worker safety assessments. But more important maybe for our discussion today um, are the methods we use uh, for internal information or for our decision making. So uh, we have a toolbox filled with all kinds of cell models and readouts and technology platforms. For example, high content imaging, where we use um, uh, analyze organoids for mechanistic investigation. So we focus here on the main uh, target organs of toxicity, of course, the liver, kidney, lung, heart, and so on. 
Um, we also started a while ago uh, with MPS um, platforms. We use uh, Mimetas uh, yet and a Tissues platform, and we recently also invested in the Emulate system. Uh, however, I must say, um, in NDS, so in our department, we uh, up to now um, are doing only pilot studies with this method and proof of concept studies. Um, however, the expectation, of course, is that in the future, the results from the advanced organ models in combination with the MPS uh, platforms can be used uh, as supportive data for our de-risking of the uh, drug candidate programs. Okay, thank you, Ayo. And last but not least, we have Phil. Yep, hi, <coughs> I'm Phil Hewitt. I'm um, based here at Merck KGAA in Darmstadt, Germany. So I'm obviously British and now German because of Brexit. And I apologize if you hear this horrible cat noise behind me. I, She's been gone for nine hours and now she comes in just now. But I'm, I'm originally biochemist from England. I did my master's degree in England in toxicology. And after a PhD in in vitro models all the way back in to, to the early 90s, I was doing in vitro studies and a short postdoc in San Francisco. I joined Merck a little bit earlier than Mario joined BI. So in 1998, my job hasn't changed too much apart from responsibilities. I've been in the in vitro tox lab more or less the whole time. And currently, I'm the head of the early investigative talks, which is all the in vitro gene talks, SIP induction, immune talks. But also of relevance today, we have a, a new very small group um, focusing on advanced cell culture models. Um, I'm also involved in other things within, within the company, independent, which I don't think we need to talk about today. But I did put on there, Merck is a very high pressure with this 4R. Merck has a fourth R, by the way not just the three hours, so this is very important. I think it's also important for the discussion today. So I think because of time, maybe quickly go to the next slide. And um, Merck is probably not as invested as some of the other companies in NAMS. And to be honest, NAMS hasn't really been used at Merck until this year. Uh, it's quite a new term for us. But in terms of advanced cell culture models and alternatives, as, as Mario was discussing, we also have been, do, we do the standard, we have a lot of in silico models, we have the skin sensitization models being implemented for our chemists, because Merck is a chemical company, not just pharma. Uh, we do use liver micro tissues on a sporadic basis for more for mechanistic questions, it's not um, implemented routinely, but we are looking at all of the advanced cell culture models. We have an emulate system. We're in the process of implementing the Mimitas gut, so the CACA2 model into routine screening. So we want to have that. In fact, we ran our first project for, for uh, an, an early discovery program uh, this month. So that's our first real organ on a chip system, which we've implemented. But there's also across the safety pharmacology area with the IPSC cardiovascular um, tissues. Fossil contraction is a really hot topic to drive in beta models to replace the guinea pig. Um, our main focus is liver and small intestine in my group, and we are involved in multiple collaborations because we don't have internal resources. I won't go through them all, but they're listed there all. So we are very active, but more on the sidelines, looking in from the outside a little bit. But looking forward to the discussion today, each and everybody. Okay, thank you, everyone. And I'm, I'm very happy to have you here and to discuss today. And we have already, you can see that we get questions coming in. Um, um, to get started, um, and while there's more question coming in, um, I, I really wanted to kind of uh, discuss uh, the term NAM and because it comprises a wide range of methodologies. And uh, as, as Phil mentioned, uh, some people um, have not ever used this uh, or just started to use this. Um, but in, in, in terms of um, and now, and over the last let's say decades, um, what are technologies or what are methodologies that have been implemented the most in, in pharmaceutical companies? Any? I can. I, I yeah. mean, I think I mean, I think one thing that's over the last ten years or so, which has been, I guess, relatively universal across the pharma is steroids, so liver steroids, for example. Um, I think some companies have been implemented into routine. I think like Mario mentioned and others are using them for other purposes. And they've been around for a long time. They're very well validated, whatever that might mean, um, and well accepted the data you generate. Um, so I think that's one area where we really see something routine. It's now a routine assay. And the other area, which is more, I guess, in terms of computer prediction. So it's not necessarily AI, but in, in terms of, we have a lot of models now being developed in the last few years 
partially driven by this big IMI project, eTransafe. We have people internally that have been developing many models, which are now really used to all discovery projects with multiple endpoints uh, relating to talks. Mm -hmm. How about the others? Any anything oh. to add to? to yeah, so I think, for instance, um, a good Bible to study in the development and the history of the development and, and, and let's say the application of methods is um, the SCCS notes of guidance, where you can look up the development of um, different opinions on the different nums. So, for instance, for skin sensitization, there were several you know phases where we first looked at the methods, um, then on combinations of methods in the end we uh, prioritized several methods and combined the results and defined approaches or IATAs and that is now in a phase where you look at uh, regulatory acceptance in the end. Of course um, as Phil mentioned in silico uh, approaches are also very valuable and important for us for instance to prioritize um, in, at an early phase of innovation but also to, to get additional information and at, in these kind of defined approaches that we use to come to a risk assessment in the end. So MPS systems are also something that we're very much interested in and we're using that in case studies. Currently, I, said, I think it was set for it's more in, in case studies to evaluate the systems, but recently we switched to a phase where we now just try to evaluate all cosmetic ingredients in case studies to show the, the purpose-driven validity of the, the outcome. <clears throat> and maybe I um, go on. Um, yeah, as mentioned already on my slide, um, um, so um, to be implemented um, in vitro, to implement in vitro methods, there must be a good basis of validation. And uh, therefore, it takes a while for, uh, for um, all the new assays uh, um, until enough data are available and maybe also guidelines follow and this takes uh, a long time and uh, when you uh, say uh, or when you ask about the last 10 years then I would mention uh, these uh, assays uh, for uh, skin uh, tolerability, skin sensitization, corrosion, irritation and so on so these replaced also the animal experimentation for the different purposes and uh, of course also the genetic tox assays maybe phototox but these are more uh, not so complex assays. Uh, you may not think about uh, uh, NUMS um, in a modern sense, NUMS uh, in more complex assays. As uh, Phil uh, said, um, spheroids, organoids, I think, uh, are uh, widely used now. Uh, we use them heavily uh, for um, early uh, toxicity screening, I must say. Um, of course, not for regulatory purpose yet, maybe uh, um, in, in some specific de-risking projects, we started to use them um, yeah, carefully, uh, not yet in a fluidics uh, setup, but in, in, still under static conditions. But uh, I think this is um, quite um, yeah, hopeful that these uh, models uh, bring uh, further value um, in, in this area before we go to the regulatory uh, purpose. Of course, um, the uh, modeling, um, I think this is a big area um, where uh, there are some success stories over the last years. It's not my expertise, uh, but also in other departments, maybe the MPK department, they use uh, this modeling very heavily. And uh, what I can say further with regard to these new um, uh, methodologies, uh, MPS um, methodology, um, they enter the different labs, also in the research departments and the pharmacology departments to build up disease models. I assume that most are still in the uh, evaluation phase and uh, pilot uh, study phase. All right, Stefan, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, listening to you, I mean, there is, I mean, you said already most of it. I think one, one point for me is that um, when we also talk about then regulatory acceptance and these things, to me, there is like two different areas, right? One thing is about, um, you know, you, you called it out the uh, skin sensitization assays and that stuff, which is, you know, it's really regulatory accepted assays to replace animal models. And then there is, I think a big chunk of the work also here is, is the mechanistic assays and here it's it's a different sort of application i would say it's more on the on the scientific question you want to address also in your uh, respective application to the regulatory authorities and and there i see 
there is a big um, value of such models because, I mean, um, an in vitro model, you can keep it under controlled conditions in vitro, as we, as I already was writing in my diploma thesis, and I think there is still value in doing that because you can really disentangle all the different aspects of potential mechanisms of to toxicity and to deeper understand it and then translate it back to the molecules which are maybe earlier in the pipeline and try to to um to improve those based on the on the findings you had hmm. okay. so i guess that has been a common theme actually i mean this entanglement and actually also the the combination of different things for a final assessment if you if you think about uh what kind of streets you could go to Rome. Um, a lot of people are just trying to, to do some simple suspension cell-based assays or 2D assays and try to combine the outcome in the end. Uh, others are trying to, to integrate these in MPS systems and others to, to emulate biology and come to more relevant conclusions in the end. So I think there are several options how to come to terms in the end. It's, it's also kind of fruitful to, to have the different approaches to be able to compare. I mean, okay. just to add on to that, I think that's a really important point because I think the context of use of these systems is essential. We don't should not always be looking for the more, most complex model if something very simple 2D tells us what we want to know. And I think that's why a lot of it is driven in our pharma company. It is a lot of it is 2D. We're not. It's difficult to switch away from something that is working quite well. There are a lot of things missing, a lot of things that don't work well, of course, but that's why we do need these new models. <coughs> Right. Uh, as I see in the, in the chat now, questions, please use for the questions the Q&A. That's, that's a much, much easier tool. Um, but I can already see that there are a number of questions um, and, and, and comments. Um, I actually would start with one of the, um, from, uh, the questions that is uh, very particular to Phil, but I think it's a very, um, so I think I know the answer, and I think it's, uh, it's also a good topic to discuss. So what is the fourth R in, at Merck? You're talking about the question in the in the chat. Yes. What is the the fourth R? For, for I'll R. say the fourth R. That's a responsibility. And um, to be blunt, I, I'm leading the replacement team, obviously, because of my position. So I'm a replacement guy. But uh, and I personally believe that all the three R's have a level of responsibility. That's why they're there. But Merck wants to concrete, put that in more of a concrete fashion, where we really have projects internally running to to show how responsible they are in terms of um, how we deal with animals, how we deal with animals after after they finish, so we homing of animals and things like this. It's a big, it's an important aspect of what we've been doing, and so I think it was more to concrete, more in a more concrete way by calling it responsibility arm. But... Okay, how about the other companies? Do you have more R's? Uh, is there anyone with with five or or, or six? Okay. Um, and then we have um, uh, an, an, another question, which um, goes into um, uh, something directly we discussed. So, um, have you already noticed um, any cost savings, either time or money, due to num-based interventions? So, I mean, as we heard, it's not not yet, let's say, that long ago that that nums really made it into um, the processes. So, as pharma take to really longer. Um, is that already possible to, to assess? I think, so maybe from my end, uh, I mean, that is obviously a, a reiterating topic coming up every now and then because the expectations are indeed that you would save costs and also time. But I think on the other hand, we also have to consider this is quite an, still quite a young um, area. And so a lot of the methods we are applying um, in for some of the portfolio projects in the early or later pipeline, they, they have first to be made, right? It's not, it's not, it's not, we don't have a shop where we can just uh, order all the tools we have in mind. Um, so, and, and this, <laughs> I think then it's needless to say about the, the, the costs we are talking here. So you also have to come up with an upfront investment in the, in the development of these tools and technologies, which at the moment, I think there is still an, an higher, maybe not higher, but equal costs, maybe sometimes even to in vivo models. Um, but, but this will pay off in the later, I mean, phases. Also, if you think then about predictivity, 
animal versus human models and these things. But that is something I, I guess at the moment, at least that's how I see that is that this is still this is still not the main driver. Um, mm. it, this will come in future. Yeah, it's, um, it's the same here. Um, it's interesting to hear these questions all, all, uh, always, but uh, uh, what I saw over the years um, uh, to switch in, um, from an animal uh, um, experiment model maybe to an in vitro uh, model um, or to further uh, um, develop um, in vitro models, um, I fully agree with Stefan. Uh, what I saw, the main driver is not are not the costs, but uh, to reduce the animals uh, that are used and to do better science, to do more rational science, to understand much more because we have to ensure safety for the for the clinic, and uh, therefore the cost uh, is not the main driver, but uh, uh, the more insights into the mechanisms uh, so that we can better assess the safety or the risk. And I'll add on to that as well that. Um, I don't see the short term uh, reduction in animals, it just means that the molecules that we push into those in vivo studies will have a better chance because we understand more that they're, they're cleaner, they're probably uh, from the pharmacology side and DPK side also better, so there's a higher chance of success. So I think the number of studies won't change in the short term, but we will have more molecules going through to the clinic, hopefully. And of course, there are a lot of costs uh, because we have also to hire um, scientists to evaluate uh, the platforms, especially the MPS platforms. We have postdocs, we have uh, young scientists um, uh, evaluating this, and this uh, is an in, uh, upfront investment. Well, from my perspective, there it very much depends on the endpoint. There, there are very simple assays in vitro that are accepted and can be used because they, they are known how to predict, so predictive values are known. Uh, more complex things like systemic toxicity issues, they require a lot of effort and different studies, different uh, type of uh, tests that are combined in the end. And the question here is, okay, can we actually convince people with a few case studies that this is, that we might have sufficient confidence in the outcome, uh, which is not easy to answer currently. So we need a lot of further effort to support this. This is actually interesting because this, this mirrors all oh, what you're saying, mirrors um, a study we have done uh, two or three years back where we did a big questionnaire with stakeholders. So a talented um, PhD student from, from the Netherlands, Nora Fransen, she interviewed, uh, I think, almost 100 um, participants from pharma, and everyone said applying, and this was particular for MPS, applying MPS is going to be increase the cost um, of the, for, for a while, but the increase, the, or the predicted increase in productivity will in the long term decrease the, the cost of drug development. So that was basically the, the, the overall opinion um, in this questionnaire, which I see, see mirrored uh, now, now here again. Um, so I see also another, um, uh, maybe one, one, one question which can be answered um, maybe quickly, maybe not. Um, Question about which of the um, uh, Rs are NUMS targeting? Are they targeting only the replacement or do, do you see it, it, it broader? I mean, Jose, if I can go first again, I personally, I see that these NAMs is um, important for all three Rs because eventually we want to replace, of course, there will be assays there which will replace certain as, uh, animal studies, maybe eventually all animals, especially for TOGs. But like I said a few minutes ago, if you can really make sure that the molecules going into those animal studies that are cleaner and less likely to cause some unexpected tox, then that's to me as a refinement. You might then need fewer animals in your studies, a tox study, instead of having 20 per group, you have far fewer because you have less um, unexpected things happening. But in that middle part, I, st I just do see a reduction because I think we will be starting to use these humanized uh, NAMs or advanced cell models for mechanistic understanding. So instead of going back and running an animal study to look at something, you would have a something very specific, which you can really trust um, in terms of a humanized uh, cell model. So I think it's across, across the board, personally. A lot of nodding, so. I think uh, overall NUMS um, can be attributed to all the three Rs. Uh, when we, uh, in my opinion, when we talk uh, um, more narrowly on the uh, more complex uh, methods, uh, the MPS organs on the ship, uh, for which we have um, a long way um, to go to uh, to um, have uh, guidelines uh, maybe for replacing anything. Um, I would consider uh, these methods uh, more um, yeah, directly useful for the first or uh, for the, for the reduction of, of the animals. Mm -hmm. Yet, 
uh, to um, uh, forward uh, yeah, cleaner in terms of, tox of, of toxicity, uh, cleaner compounds forwards so that we uh, need less animal experimentations. Mm -hmm. Or that maybe uh, that uh, all the um, that we have um, more successful drug candidates um, overall uh, in the R and D process um, that uh, reach the market, so that we don't have uh, so many attritions for which the animal experimentations uh, are wasted. I think that the, the replacement also in toxicology. This is, I mean, that is that is quite a high hanging bar, right, <laughs> or high hanging fruit, because I mean. I, I would fully agree that I mean reduction and refinement, as in as Mario and Phil said. I mean this is at the moment something which is already highly valuable because I mean uh, every molecule which will not come into the clinic, for example, needs some additional molecules to be run again through the regulatory needed pipeline. Also, important. Maybe right. for cosmetics, just to, to, uh, to amend this, we don't have three hours, we just have one left. So for us, it is not a reduction in any first or second hour, it is simply just the only way to go, to, to, uh, to go forward to the third hour. All right, so we have, uh, have one um, other question already here, which um, still to the while, so I wanna jump on that one. Um, and that might might be might, might also lead to another um, topic I would like to discuss. But where where are they used? So I mean, you're all toxicologists, so we 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 have a, a lot of um, expertise in safety here. And typically in safety, it is all about having a standardized model. So the the question is, um, are the nuns um, aiming only for the standardized model, or can you also use that then as an opportunity to to actually model patient variability to really recapitulate uh, the, the patient heterogeneity. I think this depends heavily on where you apply it, right? If you think, for example, adding the immune component um, to a respective in vitro model, then I think you would really like to see patient heterogeneity and you look into different HLA classes and, and whatever. I mean, the topic is. So, I mean, in an early screen, I would say, and to be pragmatic as well, I mean, you may want rather to have a, a robust model, which is not tr trying to look into every tiny bit of a piece. But then later on, if it comes more again to the mechanistic questions or to some very specific questions you want to address in that uh, respective project, and also depending on the target and the target population, then and maybe there's am i breaking up or <laughs> yeah we, we shortly lost you we shortly lost you um, break at a swiss german border maybe could be and no and and i think you could also use them for patient stratification um to look into that things so so i guess it, it really depends heavily on the question um but there is not one one sort which fits all yeah, I, I agree. I think that the further you go along the pipeline toward development, then you're going to see more of this question come up, but what is the variability uh, across the population? I think the question is also, it's not just pay, uh, keeping variable patients, but what is the difference between the healthy human being and the patient, which is something in toxicology we don't tend to address, obviously, because we have healthy animals. Um, but I think that's something where we will be able to do in the future is to implement sort of the, disease, the humanized disease models to compare. But I also agree, I think with the um, immune system, that's something where we have to have multiple patients. I, even something as simple like the cytokine release assay, we need to have multiple donors because everyone responds differently when you come to the immune system. So, but I think if you want to implement it, like we are implementing this um, GI screen um, for HD projects, that needs to be relatively simple and it won't be a, a different cells and iPS cell cells from different patients. It has to be something very simple. I mean, if if we think of the past, historically also the inbred mice strains and the rat strains are probably not so much reflecting the variability of the human beings. Uh, I think MPS systems and other systems really have the promise that you can actually integrate the variability, also not just the human variability, but also, for instance, the idea of bridging experiments from uh, 
animal cells to human cells to see whether the old his historical data are actually true for the human cells as well. Yeah, and um, I think uh, beyond our um, area, so the toxicology area, I think there is a, um, also a very good application opportunity in the uh, in the research phase in, in our industry, in the pharmacology. So the researchers, um, to my knowledge, um, try to build with these organ on ship models, for example, disease models. So uh, very to, to uh, specifically uh, investigate uh, their idea uh, of, a, of a target program to, to um, see how efficacious uh, models are not in the animals maybe in the future but in these uh, disease models or using nums a good example of that are the pdos i mean the our oncology department they are actively looking for series of organoids from patients so they want to see the, the difference in um, efficacy across all the different people and they're taken directly from patients. You see that this personalized or uh, patient heterogeneity concept more in the in the efficacy um, um, part or do you, do you think this this can also really get into the, the, the safety that you will have let's say patient stratification in, in terms of safety using NUMS? Yeah, I think Stefan already uh, touched it. Uh, I think there is, uh, I think there are ideas and we heard um, mm -hmm. the World Congress uh, um, in May in New Orleans. We heard the talk from your colleague Stefan uh, from Roche uh, uh, who um, works with MPS in the, in the clinical setting uh, to do personalized uh, stratification or observation. So for example, um, I think this yeah, is a, uh, is a good uh, field, uh, yeah, in which can be discussed whether where these uh, technologies, these opportunities in the future, may be uh, implemented uh, or used. Also, sorry to talk. Sorry. I, I think it's not only patient stratification; it's the drug stratification. So I think people are using patient material, growing their organoid or tissue, whatever it is, and then testing all the different drugs that are on the market or available what is the best drug for that specific patient and that disease and that's not common i know but it is being started to be used more but this is focused mostly on the efficacy in that case yeah do you, do you think the the, the, the the numbers can also help let's say have drugs that have safety flags but I, personally i would I'm, imagine if you know the mechanism you know what um your drug or even the drug target is likely to cause in your patient population so I think it'd be case by case. And in that case, when you know it's going to be only in, expected in 5 to 10% of your population, I would imagine that there is a possibility that we could be involved in then stratifying those patients based on something very, a readout from an MPS system to say that patient is likely to, or more likely to have a, a reaction or an unwanted reaction or not. I imagine that's quite a few years away yet, Peter. Okay. And regarding and safety assessment? Uh, Eventually, what you what you do with modeling approach is also to model the population of the individual, right? So you implement already variability based on experience and data. And additionally, if you think about okay, how to to come to risk assessment decisions, there are several safety assessment factors involved in traditional safety assessment as well, uh, which actually um, take up the inter uh, inter individual as well as the population dynamics and also the variability. I mean, I don't know whether, I assume that question will come up, Peter, but the, the implementation of AI into all of these things will drive that forward as well, I think. I mean, there is Dilly Sim out there, which is already doing that population um, for, for Dilly in the clinic. So I think that will change as we go more towards the AI part. <clears throat> and we, we heard now that, I mean, uh, although you all Toxicology is all in the safety department, but the applications in uh, there can be various applications. Um, and there's also a question maybe in that direction. Um, so, is there so uh, do you, does any of your companies have a 3R section or a 3R department, or is this something which is found everywhere in, in all departments? Or in, there's no specific section. At Mac, like I said, it has become a very important topic. I'm not that we don't employ specific people in a for our team, but we have a for our working group under our science, science and animal animal cells and welfare group. 
So we have leaders from that and we have leaders for each, each R and we have projects running under those. So there is a support and a, I think an understanding for management of those projects are important. At BI, we don't have a, a specific function or a, or a group, or um, um, but we have um, um, uh, dedicated people from different departments working together on uh, on the three R's, and uh, we are currently also updating this, maybe uh, bringing more uh, alternative methods in, in, into the context, because um, initially it's more uh, in vivo uh, uh, driven, um, but uh, I think, um, yeah. Uh, we um, bring on board also the people now uh, with alternative methods um, uh, background to these um, focus groups dealing with 3R, but not uh, uh, limited to one department. I think instead of having an isolated department, it's way more important to bring it in the individual functions and areas of the individual companies, right? So, of course, there's animal welfare offices and also at Roche, there is a big, I mean, it's also on the Roche page, um, the, the three R's concept and about animal welfare. But um, there, the idea is really to bring it into the individual function and lift that concept, which is way more important. So not having a siloed um, department somewhere, but uh, having cross-functional working groups and teams to look into that this really happens. Yeah, I agree with Stefan. It's, it's like it's a guiding principle for, for the activities in different departments also for us, toxicology, risk assessment, quality. Okay. Um, we have actually two, two questions which I, I, I would like to, to merge together because it's... Um, address the overall a, a similar topic um so the first question is about um if any of you can talk about any experience with submitting num data to the regulators and the other question is um related to that maybe um what is the about the validation so how how long is the registration process how can it be incorporated incorporated into OECD guidelines so i think how is the the, the, in, uh, the interaction with the regulators and, Maybe some data to regulators. Am I breaking up again? So it's, it's not a new concept, right? I mean, this is now I'm 13 year plus plus at Roche and, and we submit a lot of in vitro data. I mean, look at the gen, gene tox data. I mean, HERC is, I mean, that is all in vitro data and, and these are well qualified and validated mod methods. So I, I think it really depends on, on, on how, how scientifically thought through and valid the, the question is you want to address with these models. And I mean, just thinking of the recent roundtable we also had on the World MPS conference, you know, regulators, they encourage us. I mean, there is a lot of effort from European, US, uh, and you name it, around the world regulators encouraging us to submit these in vitro data. It's even in some of the guidelines, like for teratogenicity and fetal development, encouraging us to also make use of in vitro data. So I think overall, it's 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 pretty it's it's it, they are pretty open and and this works pretty well. Um, what it depends then on case by case is, as I said, I mean, if if it's really well thought through and if the model really addresses the question you want to address in in your submission. And if the, the concept you have been chosen is really well elaborated and the data is sound, right? And there it depends then on a case by case, but this is also true for in vivo models. So I don't see there is a big difference. I mean, the acceptance is really growing and increasing. Am I allowed to ask a question to you directly then, Stefan? I mean, have you actually submitted MPS data as part of any packages at Roche? Yes, yeah, sure, we have. And I mean, it depends very much on asset. I mean, it depends then on the context. Um, but it, the reason when the question submitted, um, yeah, it's not simply because of it's an in vitro model. 
Yeah, I think uh, Evan perfectly answered the question. So um, if you have a, a program with uh, difficult questions to, to be answered, uh, you put together everything for the submission. Uh, um, what you think is valid uh, to uh, argument to answer the questions. Um, and uh, the basis is that you believe in uh, in, in the data, I think, uh, that uh, you believe in, in the systems that you um, employ that they bring some benefit uh, maybe in the mechanistic uh, understanding of that um, um, yeah i must say uh, uh, the mps and knowledge um, is uh, very limited yet so we haven't uh, used this data mps data for for uh, such a purpose um, so we are still in the phase where we gain the uh, yeah um, the, yeah the knowledge how this uh, how this can be implied but uh, I think, um, and Stefan, you, you mentioned this, uh, it must be a fit for purpose uh, uh, approach. So a specific question and you have to uh, to be confident that uh, the, the method yeah, that you use, that it uh, perfectly fits um, um, the question. Yeah, And maybe also a specific MPS um, method um, can be used for a specific question and then be packed together for the submission way. But we haven't done it yet. Of these uh, methods. I'm back. I mean, part of your second part was a validation. And I, yeah. I think there's a lot of discussion going on, especially through the IQ MPS and the FDA, for example, and other regulatory agencies about how we would validate these systems. And I think it's quite clear that we will not be able to validate these advanced models like you would at a driving tools an OECD guidance document where you would do it very, very specific way to get a very specific answer. That's not going to happen, not in the in the short term, I don't think. So I think validation is an important question and we, we discuss it all the time. So you have to be really sure what you're generating is meaningful, reproducible, and um, the assay or the readout you have is, is important for your question. So for example, I, I mentioned our gut model. I mean, it's taken us all year to start our internal validation or to nearly finalize our internal validation. It takes a long time. So, In general, it is, it's pretty easy to criticize, I guess, because no model is perfect and it's really hard to implement every potential factor in these kind of systems. But um, um, sometimes it's it's a matter of timing, right? First, I think it, it would be valuable to, to agree that the concept in general is holds promise. And, and if so, then we could try to agree on specific ways or pathways how to, to come to, to, to relevant information that can convince the regulators in the end. And here, I think it's kind of a little bit hands egg problem. Who is leading? Who is doing the guidance? Is it the first case study that is um, going to regulators that makes the difference between acceptance or not acceptance? Or is it the guidance from the regulators saying, okay, these kind of specific information we want from the systems to be able to judge on that? It is not easy to, to finally come to a conclusion here. And I guess that's also why a lot of people just are hesitant to provide the information in the first place, unfortunately. Um, because obviously the regulators are willing to, to go in this direction and the discussions are very fruitful with them, but still there's still this idea of we provide information and then it's burned. And that is something where I think we need to cope with the fear. At, at least the, in the pharma side of the FDA, they seem to be at least moving towards encouraging. I agree with everything that just been said, but at least that, that new movement is towards encouraging us to submit data which should not have a negative impact on any assessment so they can do it in parallel to the in vivo studies and the submit human um, in vitro data maybe one, one brief question which um I think can we fit in um uh, uh, does everyone agree with, with, with phil that it's ocd guideline properly let's say validated is, is is beyond what we can do right now um and uh, Basically connected to that question, um, are in vivo models validated? I, I should probably temper that statement. I think I'm talking more of the advert, like organ on a chip and these yeah. types of tests yeah. are going to be difficult. Yeah. In terms of NAMs, there are, I'm pretty sure there are assays which have a very simple endpoint, like the, the sensitization assays with the based the AOP approach, those types of things, I'm fairly sure would be able yeah. to be properly validated. I, I was also referring more to, to MPS, so complex MPS. Um, and that's also the, why I think this, this question uh, uh, fitted well. Are in vivo models validated? Um, or should we see these complex, the more complex these models go 
use the same concept we use for in vivo models. Traditionally, validation of, of assays are based on their predictive parameters, right? So you need to test a lot of compounds and then you find out what are the statistics about um, how, how can I assess test set in the end. And if that is promising that you go to, to OCD and say, here it is, um, the throughput of the MPS systems is still limited. I, I wouldn't say it's impossible, but with regard to complexity of uh, different tissue type interactions and also kind of the variability between the different experiments still, it is not easy to, to say, okay, here we are. So first, I think we, we still need to, to show that the reproducibility is high, that the, the systems are transferable. And I mean, this has been proven by a lot of different um, actors in the field. I Personally, I feel now is the time to really go on and, and show that the, the results are promising for the final safety assessment as well. Maybe, um, Johan, while you're um, while you're talking, you can give a little bit of a background because I have to see that as a question too. I think many people know a little bit more about how a drug is actually going from discovery to a market. How is that for 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 cosmetic industry? So, is how does the pipeline of cosmetic industry look? What what is what is actually how long does that that take, and what is mandatory there? Yeah. Um, I guess in, in cosmetics industry, it differs because there's not the one pipeline, there are few pipelines. There's the traditional pipeline with screening approaches, prior, uh, prior in silico assessment or QSAR structure assessment, but there are also approaches that are based on uh, old fashioned, um, let's say, historical data, for instance, Hildegard von Bingen and others who showed that there are uh, things out there which are beneficial for the skin. So it depends. It depends on is it real proactive drug, or is it a, a marketing ingredient that is used, or fragrance, or whatever. Okay. And in terms of mandatory tests, is that comparable to pharma? So also we we have to assess every endpoint, meaning we need to be sure that the product in the end is safe, and product safety comes from the safety of every ingredient in it. So um, it has to be um, either linked to legacy data that we can use, or we need to uh, assess it by the nums to, to finally come to a conclusion. So there is no way around that either, but still no animals. We, we need to be sure, but without animals. Okay. So we have five minutes left and um, uh, um, uh, there's, there's one, one, one question I want to ask everyone um, and we have discussed a lot about that um, in the academic world in the, in the last years we have seen a lot of hype around MPS about AI based uh, modeling um, and but we've heard that both is actually being explored at least in, in many companies but where in you I mean, where do you see really the, the biggest impact of um, these type of, of, of new technologies. Or maybe there is no impact, maybe it is a hype, um, but so what, what's your opinion? Where, where will be the biggest impact? I think it's about, to me, at least uh, one big step forward is the human relevance, right? That we now can really do safety testing and in future even more in human models not any longer we don't have to rely any longer on i don't know rodent models or or other models um, so this to me is maybe the biggest impact and that we maybe even in future even so this is still in its infancy we can even model individual patient populations so i think overall Yeah, uh, overall, I repeat, overall safety testing gets closer to the clinic. So the preclinical safety testing gets closer hooked to the clinical safety assessment. I, mean, I totally agree with you, Stefan. But I see, at least in the short term, it really is at both ends. You have the discovery phase where the, then it's human, so the data generation is human, so you get better molecules potentially going through. And at the other end, you have the mechanistic understanding because it's human specific. I still think the middle bits, all the routine uh, regulatory safety testing will still be in animals for quite a long time to come. So we don't have 
20 organ, all the main organs we need to assess in our, in our preclinical safety studies, we don't have those organ systems available in a, in a chip or an MPS. So I still think that's a long way off before we can replace the animal, but I see the real benefit in those two extremes at the moment. I think we are um, far away from routine use of these MPS organ ownership models yet. However, I can see in the different areas a very big impact. I don't know where we would, would uh, of course, I don't know where will be the highest impact. Um, I see the impact. Uh, I can imagine the impact, the high impact in, in uh, the pharmacology to come up with uh, very good disease models for better efficacy testing, since efficacy testing is also uh, key for, for reducing the attrition uh, rate of the drug uh, programs. Uh, of course, the de-risking in toxicology, as Eva mentioned, uh, closer to the uh, human. So for specific questions, uh, say hepatotoxicity or um, transporter um, um, questions uh, for several um, um, pathomechanisms, uh, so for specific questions, fit for purpose, I think there could be a, a big impact uh, in preclinical safety and also um, uh, in the clinical setup. Uh, as briefly mentioned, I think also uh, in the clinics, this could uh, have a big impact in the, in the far future, probably. Just as a quick disclaimer, I, I have focused only on safety um, with my answer, but I totally agree. And I, I want to emphasize again, efficacy testing is even the bigger thing, right? Uh, because here, the, some of the disease models, you know, I mean, we can go now into very details, but anyway, I think, I mean, having human disease models in a dish, maybe, I mean, that, that, that's really some, that's a completely different aspect. We haven't covered a lot today, and this is also relevant in the context of 3R, maybe even more relevant than the safety testing. And this is also my personal hope so that we can kind of get to the efficacy information. You can do the efficacy testing and the in vitro um, safety information in one system, hopefully human relevant. All right, I think that that's a, a, a good closing remark. Um, so with that, I um, w would like to thank all four of you. I think it was a very, very informative discussion. Um, and I mean, we could go on in discussing different aspects of that, I think, for, for hours. Um, but um, we, we are now at the hour, so I want to thank all of you. I want also again to um, announce the, the next, uh, advertise the next um, three-hour webinar, which will be um, in November, the Pitching Science Contest. Um, as mentioned, the deadline is currently till tomorrow, but we will accept submissions till Sunday. And then um, we will have the next um, webinar. It's going to be a tandem presentation from um, Dr. Julia Marzi and Dr. Thorsten Meyer from Tübingen and Graz University about in situ monitoring of 3D cell cultures with non-invasive um, sensors. So with that, thank you to the four of you again. Thank you to our audience for all the, the questions and um, for listening to us and hope to see you all back in December. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.